I am what people call a planetary scientist, and that means that I study planets. Um, I also study moons, so for those of you who already know, Titan is a moon of Saturn. Um, planetary scientists also study moons. We study asteroids. Um, we study a lot of the different things in the solar system. Some of us even like to study the sun. Um, and sometimes we study Earth too because it turns out that Earth is a planet. So the best way that I can describe my job to people is that planetary scientists turn those points of light in the sky that you can see when you go outside um, tonight, although I'm realizing it's not nighttime where a lot of you are, but it's nighttime here. And so if you go outside tonight here, um, you see these points of light. And what we do is we, we turn those points of light into worlds um, that we try to understand in the same way that people who study Earth have been able to understand Earth by, by looking around and, and seeing all the things that we see here on Earth. And so that's what I consider to be my job is to take those points of light and turn them into worlds that we can understand. And I'm going to focus on Titan tonight because that's my favorite point of light that we have been working on turning into a world. This is a picture of Titan. I'm going to explain more about what you're seeing in a couple of minutes. Um, but first, Titan is a moon of Saturn. And so first we have to look at our pretty picture of Saturn. Um, if you can see this picture down towards the um, bottom right, hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, this kind of brownish um, blobby moon over here is Titan. You can see a couple of other moons in this picture. Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. Saturn has quite a few moons. I saw that someone in the questions already asked um, about how many of Saturn's moons have names. Um, and I actually had to already go and look because um, I don't know how many moons Saturn has. We're always finding new ones that has so many. Um, Saturn does have a bunch of moons that don't have names yet. Um, but my quick Googling confirmed that, the that there are 53 moons of Saturn that have names. Um, and then there's a bunch more that haven't been named yet. And there's probably a bunch more that haven't even been discovered yet because there's still a lot more exploration that needs to be done. So we have known about Titan's existence um, for about 400 years. So Titan was discovered by someone named Christian Huygens, and this is the discovery paper that he wrote. Uh, and so you can see that there's no pretty pictures. He was looking through a telescope, and what he could see was a dot that had ears. Um, and hopefully some of you have gotten the chance to look through a telescope and see Saturn where it looks like a dot that has ears. And if you look at it through a telescope and you see the dot that has ears, you'll probably see one other big dot. And that other big dot is Titan. And so that's what we see in this drawing that Christian Huygens made. And it was really exciting at the time because for a while when he saw the movement of Titan around Saturn, which is what this picture is showing, he thought maybe that was just rings. And it took a while to realize that no, these are actually, this is actually a moon that he has discovered. Um, and so we've known about it for, for about 400 years, but we didn't have very many other ways to study it for a really long time. And so it took us a while to learn anything else interesting about Titan. So the next kind of step that we took in turning it from just this point of light that we see in the sky um, into a world that we can study happened in the early 1900s, so about 100 years ago. And this was a picture that was drawn, so we're still not using cameras yet, of Titan. And um, this person, whose name was Jose Comosola, was the first person who claimed that he saw that Titan had an atmosphere. So an atmosphere is just a bunch of gas that's trapped because of the gravity of the planet or the moon, right? So Earth, we have an atmosphere. You can't see it, but you can feel it when it's a windy day or something like that. And this was the first claim about 100 years ago that this moon of Saturn had an atmosphere. Um, so that was pretty exciting. And I'll explain why it was so exciting in a second. Um, but then this amazing thing that we're looking at that shouldn't make any sense to any of you was our first definitive um, discovery that Titan really did have an atmosphere. And what we're looking at is what happens when light from the sun goes through an atmosphere, it can interact with the different gases in the atmosphere. And each of them kind of modifies the light, changes the light that comes through the atmosphere in a different way. So it's like a fingerprint. 
each kind of gas that's in the atmosphere changes the light in a different way. And so it's very easy to identify what those gases in the atmosphere are. And so this was our discovery that Titan has an atmosphere. And the thing that we're seeing in this particular um, piece of this particular picture that we're looking at is methane. So that's a carbon that has four hydrogen atoms attached to it. It's a gas that we have here on Earth. We see it in the atmospheres of a lot of planets. But the person who was, who was looking through the telescope at Titan at the time, his name was Gerard Kuiper. He was looking not just at Titan, but he was also looking at Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter's four big moons, so that's Ganymede, Callisto, Io, and Europa, and Titan. And when he looked at Titan, Saturn, and Jupiter, he saw this fingerprint of methane. But when he looked at Callisto, Ganymede, Io, and Europa, he didn't see it. And so those moons don't have atmospheres. They don't have methane gas in their atmospheres, but Titan does. And so Titan was really weird, and this was really exciting. And so I just want you to kind of see what I'm talking about here in picture form now. So this is a really great graphic made by Emily Lochtewall at the Planetary Society, and she calls this the not planets. So these are the things in our solar system, most of which are spherical, so they're round. Um, but they're not planets. So the big satellites of Jupiter, our own moon, um, Titan, some of the satellites of, of Neptune, hopefully you'll recognize Pluto and Charon in this picture. And the one thing that I want you to see when you look at all of the not planets is that you can see to their surfaces. So you can see that there's volcanoes on Io. You can see that there's some red ices on Pluto and Sheridan. You see the big impact, impact craters on Callisto and Ganymede. But when you look at Titan, you don't see anything on the surface. All you see is that it's this big fuzzy orange ball. And that's because Titan has this atmosphere that's made out of methane. But it's not just the methane that makes Titan look this way. So when the light from the sun comes, and it meets up with the methane, it can break the methane into pieces. And when those pieces are running around in the atmosphere, they run into each other and they make new things. So you can think about it a little bit like Legos, where if you have a bunch of different kinds of Legos, you can build all different kinds of new things, right? You can build a car, you can build a house, you can build a spaceship. The same thing is happening in Titan's atmosphere. When the methane gets broken up by the light from the sun, it makes all different Lego pieces. And then we can use those pieces to build all kinds of new things. And when we build those new things, sometimes we end up building big particles in the atmosphere. And that's why you can't see down to Titan's surface because those particles are kind of like dust and they block out the light that comes from the sun. So we can't see down to the surface. Um, so this is what Titan looked like when we finally were able to send a spacecraft to Titan. So this is from the Voyager spacecraft, which is actually even older than me. So it's not just older than you, it's even older than me. So the Voyager spacecraft went through the Saturn system in the early 1980s. And this was the picture that it sent back. And I always like to ask people, what does it look like? And the most common response that I get from people is it looks like an orange. Um, so this was kind of a frustrating picture, right? I told you that our job is to turn points of light into worlds. Um, and this doesn't look very much like a world, it looks like an orange. And so we realized that we were going to have to do some more things to try to understand how Titan really works, how it works as a world. We were carrying other kinds of instruments to study Titan besides just the camera. So this is a picture from the camera, but this thing right here was looking at those fingerprints. So this is a really fancy version of that picture I showed you before where they discovered the methane in Titan's atmosphere. And from this, this set of, of information that we got from the spacecraft, we found out that there were all kinds of other gases in Titan's atmosphere besides the methane. These are the small Legos that are getting built up when methane gets broken apart. So we're not quite to like a spaceship yet. I see that someone is building the Apollo lunar lander right now. We're not to that scale yet. We're just building like the little, like the walls for the house or something with this, this size of molecules. But this was really exciting when we got these, this information back because these molecules that we were seeing in Titan's atmosphere are the kind that maybe life would use. 
So when we see these kinds of molecules that have a whole bunch of carbon in them, we start thinking, oh, there might be life on this planet. This might be a place where life could exist. And so everyone got really, really excited about Titan after we saw that. And of course, we couldn't see down to the surface. We just saw this orange. So there could have been like elephants tromping around or something. We wouldn't have known. I'm going to skip a couple of the next slides because they're for grownups and they're boring. Um, so then, so I mentioned the Voyager spacecraft flew through in the 1980s before most of us were born. Um, but then there was a spacecraft that I actually remember. Um, it's older than probably a lot of you, maybe most of you. <laughs> um, but in the, in the mid 90s, not just the US, but also the European Space Agency decided that we needed to go back to the Saturn system. So to study Saturn, to study Saturn's beautiful rings, to study Saturn's moons. And so they came up with this spacecraft that's called the Cassini-Huygens spacecraft. So Cassini is the orbiter and Huygens was a probe that was sent down to the surface of Titan. So you can see them in this picture. Um, this is the whole uh, big thing that you're seeing here is Cassini. This gold circle thing um, that hopefully if you can see my cursor is the heat shield for the Huygens probe. And I always have to remind people when they're looking at this picture that these white things right here are humans wearing what we call a bunny suit to protect the spacecraft from earth germs. And so you can see that Cassini Huygens was not some small, cute little spacecraft like the Mars rovers. Cassini Huygens was about the size of a school bus and it was carrying all different kinds of instruments to study all different things about the Saturn um, system and Titan so that we could answer some of our questions like what does Titan's surface look like? What are all of those Legos that are building things in Titan's atmosphere? And what does that mean for the possibility that there might be life on Titan? So Cassini was built in the mid 90s. It launched in 1997. It took seven years to get to Saturn because Saturn is so far away. And then it was in orbit around Saturn um, until 2017. So it was in orbit around Saturn for 13 years. And then we purposefully crashed it into Saturn so that we could study Saturn, we could get more information about Saturn. Um, but also to protect all of the moons of Saturn because we think some of them, not just Titan, might have life. And so we didn't want to contaminate them. We didn't want to get maybe Earth bugs that had been on the spacecraft on Titan or on Enceladus, which is another moon of Saturn. And so we crashed Cassini into Saturn on purpose, which sounds kind of mean, but we did a lot of really good science when we did that. If you have questions about that, you should ask me at the end because it was pretty cool. Um, this is the first picture of Titan that Cassini took. It's kind of sad, <laughs> but kind of illustrates my point about how we turn points of lights into worlds that we can study. That was taken in 2004. Um, this is one of the, it says recent here, but this is one of the last images that Cassini took of Titan before the mission ended. Um, sorry, I don't know what that was doing. Um, so real quick, I just want to show you some cool pictures that we took from Cassini and explain to you a little bit about what we learned about Titan from Cassini. So this is the kind of same picture that I showed you before, like Voyager, where you're just kind of seeing an orange. It turns out we had the colors wrong a little bit when we made those pictures from Voyager. So Titan isn't really like super orange like it was in that picture I showed you before. It's more kind of yellow. Um, so this is what it would look like if you got to fly to Titan yourself. So Titan has these haze layers and this is when those Legos get built up and they make really, really big particles and that's why we can't see down to the surface. So we were able to study those and figure out maybe what they're made out of and how they can affect the way that um, the light from the sun uh, reaches Titan and, and reaches down to its surface. Um, it turns out that there are clouds on Titan and that also it rains. So I, I saw that someone had asked um, in the question and answers if it rains on Titan and it does, but it's so cold on Titan. So Titan is really far away from the sun. Titan and Saturn are really far away from the sun. So the water that we might have, so water like in my glass, um, on Titan, it's not just ice. It's ice that's as hard as rock. 
So if you chew, if you like to chew on ice, you definitely wouldn't want to do that on Titan. It'd be very bad for your teeth. Um, and so how can we have rain and clouds if it's so, so cold? And that's because the rain and clouds are made out of a different liquid. They're not made out of water. They're made out of methane and also a molecule called ethane, which has two carbons in it. Methane has one and ethane has two. And so these are clouds that are made out of methane at Titan's South Pole that we were able to take pictures of. This is what Titan looks like when you look at it in just a teeny, teeny, tiny amount of the light that comes from the sun. So the picture I had it before is what it would look like um, when you are just looking with your eyes. But if you had really special eyes that could only look in this very small wavelength of light, you would be able to see Titan this way instead. And we're seeing a couple of different things. So this really bright spot up here are clouds. These really dark spots at the North Pole are actually lakes and seas that are made out of the liquid methane and sometimes the ethane that we were just talking about a minute ago. So that rain, those clouds, it rains down to the surface. It makes lakes and seas just like water does on Earth. It evaporates just like water does on Earth and then it makes clouds and it rains back down again. And so if you study the hydrologic cycle in school with water, um, we do the same thing on Titan, but with methane instead. So that's pretty exciting. And then all of the dark stuff that's in kind of the middle part of Titan here, those are dune fields. So if you've ever gotten to go see sand dunes somewhere on Earth, Titan has these huge, huge dune fields. But they're kind of funny because the sand isn't made out of rock like we have on Earth. The sand is made out of all of those Legos that we built in the atmosphere that were made out of those carbon molecules that came from when the sunlight broke up the methane. So it's really weird sand and we have a lot of questions about it. Um, I told you that we sent the Huygens probe, so we didn't just get to study Saturn or Titan from um, Cassini, we also studied it from the Huygens probe, which we sent down to the surface, and this is the picture that it sent back. It might look really familiar to some of you, those things that you're seeing are rounded pebbles, just like we see on Earth if you go play in a stream or something like that. Um, but those pebbles are not made out of rock, they're made out of water ice. Um, and so like I said before, the water ice, because it's so, so cold, it acts like rock. And this is an example of that. So we think the Huygens probe landed in kind of a stream bed that had dried out for a little while. And so we didn't see any flowing liquids on the surface, but we saw this evidence um, from the rocks being tumbled over and over again that they had been, um, that they had been in a stream at some point. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the other cool things that Cassini was carrying was an instrument called the radar, which probably you've heard before. And the thing that's cool about the radar on Cassini is that all of that, all those particles in the atmosphere that got in the way of light, the radar doesn't care about them. And so we can see really down to the, really well down to the surface. And so that's what these are made out of. Um, so we're looking at Cassini radar now of the North Pole. And those are, these are those lakes and seas that, that I was just showing you a second ago. Um, but this time you're able to see them much, 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 much better because the radar doesn't care about the atmosphere, unlike the um, imaging data that we were looking at before. So those are the lakes that I was just talking about. You can also see that there's a whole bunch of streams just like we see on Earth. This, this picture looks very Earth-like. And then I mentioned those dune fields. And so here's using still the Cassini radar. So we, we don't have to worry about the atmosphere. These are the sand dunes that we see on Titan. But remember, they're not made out of rock, not made out of sand that came from rocks. They're made out of sand that came from um, those carbon molecules in the atmosphere. And then finally, and this is important for Dragonfly, there's one other kind of place that we're super interested in on Titan. And so this is a Cassini radar um, image of a crater on Titan. So just like we see craters on the moon, I mentioned them on Ganymede and Callisto before, Titan has craters that are formed from an asteroid or a comet crashing into it. But the thing that's cool when that happens on Titan is that because the crust of Titan is made out of water ice, when you have an asteroid or a comet crash into it, it puts all of that energy into the surface and then it heats it up and it melts that water, that, that water ice. And so we end up with liquid water on the surface. And then that liquid water interacts with those Legos that we were building before from the atmosphere and does all kinds of new chemistry. And we think that some of that chemistry might be related to the possibility of life. 
And so when I talk, talk about dragonfly in a second, dragonfly is going to go to a crater, a former, former pool of water that was caused by an impact of an asteroid or a comet, because we want to study that chemistry. We want to understand whether or not that could be important for life um, on Titan now, life on Titan in the past, maybe help us understand how life on Earth started. And so that's going to be one of the places that we're really excited about. I'm going to skip this slide. Let's see. Okay. Um, so when we sent the Huygens probe to the surface of Titan, we didn't know what it was going to land on. Um, and so that's actually one of the reasons why it's called a probe. If you look at different um, planetary spacecraft, if we call it a lander, it's supposed to land. Um, if we call it a rover, it's supposed to rove. But the Huygens probe didn't have to do either of those things. And the reason was we didn't know what the surface of Titan was made out of. And so a bunch of scientists who studied Titan made this betting pool about what Huygens would land on. And so some people guessed it would land on ice, like I mentioned before. Um, some people guessed that it would land on tar because we knew there were all these carbon molecules in the atmosphere. Um, one person guessed it would land on liquid. A whole bunch of people guessed that you wouldn't be able to figure out what it landed on. And they were the ones that were the closest to being correct, unfortunately, because it's hard to study planets sometimes. Um, but my, my all time favorite one, if you see on the end, somebody thought that the Huygens probe would get eaten. And that's a, a very famous planetary scientist named Dave Stevenson bet that, that uh, Huygens was going to get eaten when it landed on the surface. So he was pretty optimistic about the possibility of life on Titan. But this is what, what Huygens found when it landed. So I showed you the bottom right, um, I showed you that picture already, but these other pictures are from slightly higher up before it landed. And so you can see here that this is a big kind of stream area, big dried wash, where we now think that there are floods, seasonal floods that come through. They're big, they're catastrophic, they happen quickly and then they're over quickly. And so for most of the Titan year, which is about 30 Earth years, this area is dry. Um, one thing that I think is really cool, and so I always have to show people, and we're almost to the end of the slide, so you can ask questions. Um, this is actually my favorite picture from Cassini, and I can I can look at the um, Q and A I think real fast, and also the chat. Does anybody have any guesses about what we're looking at right now? Can any, anybody identify what this picture is? Somebody guessed the sun. <laughs> Somebody guessed Titan. It is it is a combination of both Titan and the sun. So we're we're making progress towards getting the answer together. So we're looking at Titan, but that, that bright thing at the top is sunlight. Everyone, everyone's distracted by the fact that we can't see all of Titan. That's okay. So if you've been in an airplane and you have flown over the ocean, somebody just got it. <laughs> Um, if you've flown over the ocean or a um, river or a lake that's very, 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 very smooth, you'll see the sun glint that comes off of that really smooth surface as if that, that liquid surface was a mirror, right? And that's called a sun glint or we call it a specular reflection. So this is a sun glint off of a lake on Titan. That lake hadn't been named when this happened. And so it was named um, Jingpo Locus, which means mirror lake. All of the lakes on Titan have to be named after lakes on Earth. That's one of our rules. Um, and this is really cool, I think, because this is the first time we've ever seen this phenomenon on another world. So we had never before seen a sun glint off of a body of liquid on another world before. Because in fact, the only two places in the solar system that currently have standing bodies of liquid are Titan and Earth. And so that's one of the reasons why we're so excited about Titan. Okay, um, we're gonna skip this because it's boring. Um, so I just want to talk about Dragonfly for a couple minutes um, and then I'm going to um, answer all of the excellent questions that I can see you all have been putting um, in the Q&A, although I don't know what they all are yet, so I'm a little nervous. Um, so we had all of these, these cool things that we found out from Cassini and Huygens and that just made us more excited about Titan. We know now that it has all these Earth-like processes. It has clouds, it has rivers, it has lakes. 
all of this chemistry that's happening in the atmosphere with the different Legos that we're building makes us think that there's the possibility that there might be life on Titan. And if there's not, we'll still be able to learn a lot about the chemistry that might lead to the origin of life. And so we asked NASA um, a couple of years ago now, if we could send another mission to Titan to study these things in more detail, to really understand the chemistry, to really understand um, how the sand dunes work and what the impact craters do and all of those things that I just mentioned. And so we proposed this mission called Dragonfly and NASA selected it. And we just had a Dragonfly team meeting this week that ended today. So I'm like super excited about Dragonfly, um, maybe even more so than normal. And this is the Dragonfly team. Um, so I think probably a lot of you are tired of of the pandemic and Zoom and everything else. And I can assure you that NASA mission teams feel the same way um, because we had to have our team meeting over Zoom, as you can see. Um, but this is what we're going to do. So we're going to send Dragonfly, which is a dual quadcopter, or we sometimes call it a rotocraft lander. It's better known as a drone to Titan. So this is us descending on parachute. We'll fly to our first landing site, which is near somewhere called Selk Crater. I mentioned earlier why we're so excited about craters in terms of understanding the chemistry. So we'll land. We have two drills, which you can't see very well here, but they're on each of the skids. We can drill and collect samples and ingest them to different instruments. We'll take pictures. Once we've done all the science that we can do in that spot, then we'll pick back up and we'll fly somewhere else. And so we'll be able to relocate ourselves many, many, many times over the lifetime of the mission. We'll be able to explore new places um, and be able to answer a lot of the questions that we have about Titan. This is, in case you didn't get a good picture of it when I was just showing you the animation, this is um, the kind of current concept of what Dragonfly will look like. Again, the drills are right here, one on each of the skids. This big circle thing at the top um, is our antenna. So that's how we talk to Earth, how we get instructions, how we send all of our data back, all of these things. Um, this list over here that is full of all kinds of science words is a list of the instruments that we're carrying. So I'll just tell you quickly what they are. We're carrying something called DRAMS, which is a mass spectrometer. And the best way to think of it is that is how Dragonfly can taste things or smell things. And so this is how we're gonna identify all of the different molecules that we're looking at um, based on the properties that they have in the same way that you would smell um, coffee or chocolate or something like that. This instrument will be able to identify molecules. Draco are our drills. And so that's how we're drilling into the surface to get our samples. Um, we have an instrument, which is my favorite instrument name, which is called Dragons. So we're sending dragons to Titan. Um, dragons is something called a gamma ray neutron spectrometer. And that is also going to tell us what the, what the surface underneath, the, underneath us is made out of. Um, we have something called Dragnet. Um, which is a seismometer, so we'll find out if there's Titan earthquakes, and also a meteorology package, so that tells us things like the temperature and the wind speed, all of the things that you would need to know if you wanted to predict the weather on any given day to figure out if it would be a good day to fly. And then the last instrument that's listed there is Dragon Cam, and those are all of our cameras. Um, and we have a whole bunch of different cameras because cameras are really important for the way in which we fly. And then this is the last slide and then I'm excited to take your questions. Um, I thought this was great because um, this has someone who's approximately, I think, all of your age um, looking at a mock-up of Dragonfly in virtual reality. This is not a full-scale mock-up. Um, so, and I'm realizing I have the wrong units for you all, but Dragonfly is about five feet tall. So it comes up to about here on me, although you can't see the rest of me for scale. Um, and it's about 10 feet long. So Dragonfly is about the size of a Mini Cooper, um, for those of you who have seen a Mini Cooper. Um, but I just thought this was a cool video um, of our VR that we have. Um, and it's fun to watch all of the team try to go inside of Dragonfly um, and see all the different pieces and stuff like that. Um, I think that's it for the video. Uh, so with that, I would love to, to look at all of your questions. <laughs>